aren't special. Bigamore says only the stars that produce light should praise Hashem. What? The ones who don't produce light shouldn't praise Hashem. Right? We don't want to imply anything of that sort. So if I say it's a special parsha, not because there's parshas that are special and parshas that are not special, just we should know that every parsha is special. Whereas my mother used to say, I love all of you children, but differently. <laughs> Not more or less, just differently. So every parsha should be that same way. We should feel the same way. Parshas Vayera. So we know Hashem had appeared before. That's not really so sensational. However, here he came and didn't tell Abram any news. Before he came and told him, you're going to have children, or you're going to get Eretz Yisrael. And Abram was very excited. He built an altar. He built a Mizbeach, and he called out in the name of Hashem. Rashi says he had a karasatov when he got a good piece of uh, news from Hashem. What, I'm going to have children? We're going to get Eretz Yisrael. He got so excited, he built an altar, and not only, obviously, offered something on the altar, but he also spoke out in the name of Hashem. He was makar of people to believe in Hashem. Here we see Hashem appearing, and there's no message. Just he appeared. What is he doing appearing without any message? Rashi says he was visiting the sick. Visiting the sick. Which obviously, Abraham Avinu was right after bris mila. It says it was the third day after bris mila, the harshest day for after an operation. And he was in pain. Rashi says he was taking his bandages off and putting them back on. That's what people do when they're trying to feel better. They take the bandage off, they readjust it, they give it a bit of air, they put it back on again, maybe with a little bit of medicine this time. And actually, the, later when the Malachim show up, they see that he's doing that and they want to go away. They, they show him that they're about to leave because they don't want to bother a sick person who's right after an operation. But that's where he was holding. And yet, Rashi says he was so upset that he wasn't getting any, any guests, any business. There was no one coming in for his special Hachnasis Orchim business of, it, of bringing guests in and telling them about Hashem. He was very uh, disturbed. Hashem had to bring three Malachim that looked like Arabs, so he would think he has the mitzvah. But in any event, this is a special lesson that Hashem will come even if he doesn't say anything, like some we say when we learn, for example, when we learn, it says the Shekhinah's there, right? The, the, the mission of us goes through a whole bunch, with ten people, five people, three people, two people. Hashem is always there when we learn, especially if we learn with, with others. Hashem Shekhinah comes and dwells there. And why do we need to know that, right? Hashem is not coming and telling me anything. Although we say every morning, he's melame Torah, lamo Yisrael, he's melamed. So if he's melamed, that means when I'm learning Torah, he's teaching me. It's not just I'm learning this old book that we found from hundreds and thousands of years ago. It's right now, my siyata deshmai and learning this piece of Gomorrah, whatever it is, is he's teaching me. So that could be one shot why I benefit when Hashem comes and if I'm lucky, he comes and he joins us in our learning. Another thing, as Rashi says here, was not just to be mavakar the chola, to see what he's doing. Rashi says, v'sho'al v'shlomo. He asked how he's doing. Right? It's like you come up to someone, shalom aleichem. That's called sho'al v'shlomo. And on a more practical level, you ask someone, how are you doing? Do you need any help? Do you, is everything okay? When you visit a sick person, you're actually supposed to. The more brings the story of Rabbi Akiva, the more in the Darim of all places, that he had a Talmud that hadn't shown up for a few days, and he went to see what was happening, and he ended up uh, cleaning up the entire house and getting everything, making sure this fellow had everything he needed. And uh, not just in the ancient days, there was a story I read once about the Beis HaLevi, who lived about 100 years ago or so. He also was on a trip somewhere with a very important uh, mission of going to a special rabbi's convention or whatever, and they were waiting for him. And on the way, a, uh, a goy said to him, 
You Jews don't take care of each other, do you? Because there's a fellow over here who is very sick, and no, no Jews come to help him. Of course, the Goy didn't help him, but that's besides the point. He's not supposed to. The Jews are supposed to help the Jews. So the Beis Alevi went with his, uh, his, his shamish to visit this guy and found that he really wasn't doing well. The fellow wasn't living by himself, wasn't doing well. And even today, we should know that can happen. Uh, there's a fellow in Telstone who, uh, he, he was an old man who lived by himself. Wasn't so old. I mean, you used to see him walking around and he would talk to people and so on and so forth. But at a certain point, his neighbor noticed he hadn't come out of his house in a few days. Or one day or two days. At a certain point, luckily, within time that was needed, he, he, he got someone to break the door down. And the, and the fellow had tried to do something by himself, which can happen with older people. They can try to do things on their own because they... They don't want to have to ask everyone for help. And then something can happen. I saw that happen to once an older fellow tried to do something in shul and he fell. And this fellow was uh, probably would have died if this neighbor hadn't been on the ball and, and noticed and it's something we should all keep in mind, to, to be more aware of our surroundings, of people who live, especially today, of a lot of uh, single people living in Machsanim and, you know, and hardly anyone pays attention. There was a fellow in Telstone who, passed away in a, one of these rental uh, machsanim, a one person, one thing, and nobody knew until the smell got so horrid that they finally had to break the door down. They had to go up the net for three or four days. Because nobody was coming to see them. That's right. We have to be very aware of it, especially even though you think in our day and age we're so advanced and so this and that, and nobody's really that poor, no one's really that. But it can happen. It can happen on your doorstep. People around you need help so on and so forth. So that's one of the lessons that we have to learn here, that even a Kaddish Baruch who has plenty of important things to do in his world, of running the world, I can imagine just running a yeshiva how hard it is, how much how hard, much harder it is to run a city or a, or a country or a whole world, to make sure everyone in the world has exactly what they need every minute of the day. It must be a very hard job. Right? Of course, nothing's hard for Hashem. But I would think he has better things to do. The answer is no. He loves the Jewish nation so much that he would even come personally. And we have stories of Gedolim. Today I was told is the York site of Rav Shach, Zechus Sadik the Bracha. And I had the schools to meet him a number of times. And it was a tremendous experience to meet such a humble person and someone with so much simcha and so bubbling over with Torah that uh, he was accessible to everyone as well. This is part of my story that they say even when he was in the hospital for his own problems, he heard about there was another fellow in the hospital that he felt he could influence. He's a fellow, he said, who he's been trying to get him to be with Shalom with his wife for many years. This fellow's been stubborn and not giving in to his wife on certain issues. And there was a problem with Shalom Baez. He said, I'm going to go visit that fellow. And people told him, you know, you're sick, you're not well, get back in bed. He says, no, I've been trying to influence this fellow for so many years. Now, maybe with the schus that I'm in here sick, but I'm going to try with my all, all my strength, be moister nefesh, to go do this mitzvah. Maybe that will bring the extra siyat to the shmaya that this fellow should finally listen to his wife and give in, which we know how hard that can be. And maybe with that extra schus, that extra mysterious nefesh, I'll create uh, finally amongst this family shalom bayis. A little bit like Kanish Warfa coming and visiting Avram Avinu and, and caring about helping him to feel better, and then ultimately sending him orchim, because that's really the only thing that would make uh, Avram feel better, is to get the mitzvah of Knesset's orchim. So even if you came and say nothing, even if you come and don't say anything, like by a shiva, if you come and just sit there and let a person know, like Rav Shatz, Rav Shatz actually said last week, you're just coming and saying shalom aleichem to someone, just coming and shaking his hand even for a few minutes, acknowledging that you care about him can make a big difference. And the truth of the matter is, we see in this parsha what incredible chesed Avram did. Not only did he learn from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, it says he called his little hotel for chesed Eishel. That's an expression, Eishel Avram. Right? Eishel means like a an inn, like an inn. It also means a pardes. So they say that the nickname Eishel Avram was kind of like showing where he got the message. The message is, go out to a pardes, go out to an orchard. And what do you see in the orchard? These trees are providing tremendous 
hospi their tremendous hospitality for not just one type of animal, the birds, insects, squirrels, right? Some places you have foxes who live underneath trees, they burrow underneath, and so on and so forth. Of course, kids love to play in trees and uh, so on and so forth. They give over their wood sometimes. They have this book called The Giving Tree. Very nice muscle for how we should try to give. And uh, they also, today we know that the leaves produce this incredible chesed called oxygen. Right? Just breathing the air in the world that we live in, we don't even realize. Of course, today they say, of course, you plant trees, you can change the climate for the better, and so on and so forth. But just a simple act of giving up oxygen, taking in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, which is a poisonous gas, and then all of a sudden the leaves are taking in that and using it and producing oxygen in return. That's a tremendous chesed. It's a tremendous give and take in the world that Hashem created that we appreciate. Now that we know scientifically what, what's happening, we can appreciate even that part of the, the, tr the work of a tree as it were. And that's what Avram noticed. Avram said, I want to be like that. I want to create an Eishel Avram. I want to create a house which is producing nonstop chesed like the trees that don't ask any questions. Uh, sorry, Mr. Squirrel. Uh, who were your parents? Uh, no, no, no. Another tree. Go to another tree. No. Trees don't re reject squirrels because their lineage is wrong or because they don't wear the right kippah or something like that. Right? Trees just... Give and give and give, right? Come into my tree, come into my little abode and, and make your nest and make your the house. There's a book that was written on that called The Giving Tree. I mentioned a few minutes ago. The book? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It means we're thinking on the same level, same way. Okay, so the point is that Abram did that. Now, the Midrash actually says that Avram wasn't just a tremendous guy who looked around and noticed things that Hashem had done and learned from them. That was part of his greatness. It says that he learned from the ants not to steal. And a lot of the Torah he figured out on his own. That's why it says the only mitzvah he hadn't yet done was bris milo. Because that's the only one, you, if you do it, and then Hashem decides to command you, you can't do it anymore. But if you do chesed, and then Hashem commands you to do chesed, you can do it again. So that's the only one he hadn't done. All the rest he figured out on his own. But this amount of chesed that he set up a place where three Arabs come in, you know how to make them feel good, you know how to invite them in properly, and you have to make sure that they wash their feet in the right way so that you have no problem of a or whatever. And today, obviously, we have our own things. We have to make sure when guests come in that they leave them at the door or whatever, right? So he knew how to do that without embarrassing someone, making them feel at home. And then he told them, I'm just going to give you a bit of food. Is that an error to eat a little bit of food before you, you travel? And then what did he do? Okay, go check three cows and take this huge amount of dough and, right, a feast. The Gemara says in Bab Metziah, the feast that he made for them, and if you read the parsha, you have no idea. Read the Gemara in Bab Metziah. I think it's Pei Gimel, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there. It says was Kisuda Shlomo Beshaito. Like we know Shlomo Amalek was a king who created a tremendous feast not only for himself, but for example, when they made the base of Migdash, when they finally inaugurated the base of Migdash, he made a huge feast for the entire nation. It says the suit of Abraham Avinu was about like that. It was about that good. Right? You think of he shechted three cows. Why? He could have shechted one. Right? I, I would have not even shechted one. Give him soya. Why give him real meat to save a bit of money? Right? No. A real cow and three of them. Why three? Because I want to give each one a separate tongue from the cow. Rashi says, with kardal, with mustard. Don't forget the mustard. Right? You know what it's like to eat in a deli without mustard. Guachnefesh, right? So, he did it so, so beautifully. Where did he learn that? Where did he learn that level? You don't learn that from a tree. The tree is a great muscle for providing hospitality and so on. But the, the level he did, that's not enough to explain that. So the Midrash says that Avram Avinu, Rashi in this parsha makes a lot of cheshbonos about when he was born and when this and that and the other. Rashi doesn't mention this aspect, but you can say this is part what comes out if you read all the Rashis about his age and when he lived and so on and so forth. Part of it comes out that he also met Shane Ben Noah. 
He met Shane. He lived 10 generations after Noah. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avos says, there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah, and another 10 generations from Noah to Abram. But somehow or other, if you add up all the years of how long he lived and how long everybody else lived, because I'll say he met up with Shane ben Noah. Now we know that he also met Malchitzedek, who was right, Kohen of uh, whatever, and he was also from the time of Shane ben Noah. But he met Shane ben Noah. He met Shane ben Noah. Right? What? Hmm? That was Shane. So that's how he met him. He met him over there by the, after he killed the, 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 the Malachim, and he won, the, he won the battle. He came out and he gave him Miser, and, and uh, Shane, who's Malchit Zedek, gave, gave him uh, food and drink and so on and so forth. But they also chatted. Apparently they chatted. They had a whole discussion. One of the things that Avram was dying to know, so to speak, he really wanted to know was, in what zechus did you come out of the Teva? Which is an extremely interesting way of looking at it. I would have said, in what schus were you saved from the flood? He didn't say that. He said, in what schus did you come out of the table? Because really, being saved, it was enough just to leave them in the table. They could have been living in the table for the rest of their life. I saved them. Isn't that enough? I saved them, and they were left in the table? No. Hashem brought them out of the table, gave them another chance to live in the world, right? And start all over again. They didn't have to do that. They could have just left them in the table. So it's an extra schus. More than even being saved is coming out of the table and starting all over again. What schus did you have to do that, he asked. Now, what did Shane say? Anyone know? He said, because for one entire year, we non-stop did chesed. Non-stop chesed. 24 hours a day for over 365 days in the table. They had to feed every single animal exactly what that animal ate. In fact, there was one animal they weren't sure, and all of a sudden this famous story where the little uh, insect came out and they saw that was what it needed to eat. Every animal, what it needed, and one time they came late, he came late to feed the lion, and what happened? He got a patch from the lion. That's why it says Noah limped after the flood. Ach Noah, not the whole Noah survived. Ach Noah, only Noah, which means not all of Noah survived. What didn't survive? He limped. He had a he had a patch in his leg. He had some defect in his leg after the flood, and that was because he came one time late to feed the, the lion. That means from that we can be medayik that the rest of the year he came on time to feed the lion and the bear and the giraffe and and all the other animals, and he had the whole family working together. It was a team effort, right? And that's one of the problems with Ham, that after all of that lesson, what did he do with his father after he came out of the table? He couldn't do him a chesed of covering him. He had to go and embarrass him and tell the brothers, ah, the father's naked over there. <laughs> or even worse, according to some drushas in Chazal, he didn't learn the lesson of chesed, whereas Shane and Yephis said, hey, that's, first of all, we're not even going to look. We're going to turn around, we're going to take a cloak, we're going to walk backwards and cover our father. We're not going to laugh at him. We're going to do him a chesed. He's not going to have to worry that we saw him even. Okay? They learned their lesson from the table. Okay? And that's what he told Abram. We did that, and that's what helped us to be saved from the table. So Abram said to himself like this, hmm, if they did that for animals, and that helped them to be saved, what if I do that for humans? What if I do that for human beings? Al achas kama v'kama. He made a kalva homer. And that's why he set up the incredible chesed machine that we see operating in this week's parsha. And that's why he did it for Messiris Nefesh. Because you don't think they were tired some of the time in the Teva? You don't think they were exhausted after a one month? I, I, I don't know if I would last one week doing all that. Right? And plus they had to clean up. It wasn't just beating. It said the bottom floor, there were three floors of the table. The bottom floor was for what? All the manure and the waste. That means they had to clean up part of the, it's like in a, in a barn, right? People live on a farm, they have to clean the barn once in a while, right? Make sure it doesn't just pile up to the sky. That's part of chesed also, making sure everything's clean. Like when you go to visit a sick person, making sure everything's clean. You go to a hospital, make sure everything's clean. I, the nurse, the uh, I have a mitzvah to make sure this person I'm visiting is happy. Clean up a bit, 
bring him something to eat, whatever you have to do, right? This is who we are as grandchildren of, of Abram. So that's one way to be saved. Today, everyone's wondering, how, how can I be saved from all these horrible dangers that are out there lurking around? Who knows? I, I read an account of one guy, I think he lived in Hebron, and he was stabbed by an Arab, and, it was a, and he had a sukkah. He saw the Arab going around the sukkah, but he didn't see him coming out the other side. He was like wondering, when is he going to come out the other side? Until he realized he's behind him, and he slid his stomach. Right? How can we even protect ourselves? I was sitting at the Tachin Merkazi, waiting for a bus. I wanted to read something. I think, am I allowed to read now, or do I have to be looking around the entire time that maybe some Arab standing behind me with a long knife, or some old Arab woman is going to pull out of her cloak knife? We can't. It's impossible, almost impossible, to protect ourselves. We need tremendous yadish life. How are we going to do it? Oh, our great great grandfather taught us how. He has shame Ben Noach. What schools did you have to be saved from the flood? What schools did you have to come out of the Teva and live a normal life again? And which is what we want to do. We just want to live a normal life again. Just, you know, it's all, all we'd like to do is just go back to living the normal life we used to live. With no one stabbing us. Or running over us at a bus stop. Or whatever. How do we get back to that? How do we come out of that Teva, so to speak? Ask Shane Ben Noach. That's what Abram did. He learned from Shane Ben Noach. Do not stop chesed. Right? Now you would say, well, look, I'm sitting and learning, or I have other things to do. Right? Fine. But you can do chesed. First of all, when you dab and you're doing chesed, you're asking Hashem to bring health to everyone in Klai Yisrael. You're asking Hashem to bring parnasa to everyone in Klai Yisrael. If you realize that's why we dab and Belash and Rabbi, we don't just dab for ourselves. It's always in the plural. Because... I'm dabbing to the entire nation. Now, of course, I'm not big enough to do the job myself. Everyone has to dab, but that's part of what I'm doing. That's a tremendous chesed. Also, when I do any mitzvah, I'm bringing shefa down. And I can have that come on. Please, Hashem, some people that say he ruts them before they do a mitzvah, that this should bring shefa into the world to bring us safe passage when we go wherever we're going and health, happiness, whatever. Just a feeling of security. And, of course, learning. Learning is the biggest chus and the biggest chesed. When you sit and learn, you're bringing such shefa into the world you can't even imagine. That's probably one of the reasons why Rashi stresses that Noach learned Torah. Rashi says, I have a proof that Noach learned Torah. What's the proof that Noach learned Torah? We had it in this week's Gomorrah. Because Hashem said to him, I want you to bring onto the Teva the animals that are tahor and the animals that are not tahor. Well, what does that mean, tahor? It means I wash their feet before they come on the table. They're clean. No, it doesn't mean clean. Pure. What purity are we talking about? I'm going to put them in a mikvah, right? No. There's kosher animals, not kosher animals. And there's one that are kosher put on a mizbeach as a korban, and ones that are not. That, Rashi says he knew, and that's why he's telling him, bring seven extra ones for korbanos, right? Because, and Rashi says, from here he learned Torah. Perhaps that's one of the extra lessons that that was part of his schus to be saved, was to, to, to learn Torah. That's a tremendous chesed, a tremendous mitzvah. Okay? So that's something we can think of, to model ourselves after Shem ben Noach and, and all the chesed that was done on the table. And our great-grandfather of Rome, and even the gedolim that we see, like Rav Shach, who constantly went out of their way. One time he went all the way from Yerushalayim to, uh, to, to Yerushalayim, which is very hard in those days. From B'nai Brak to Yerushalayim, it wasn't like today, you have the Kfish Reshit. There were little tiny roads in those days. And, and, and he went, so it could take three hours. But he still, he said, I want to speak to this person. I want to be Mechazik this Bachar, or whatever, right? And we know he spent hours and hours of his day just accepting people and helping people, be Mechazik people, and of course, running Kla Yisrael eventually. And that's, we learn from our condoling as well, that they, they did not stop almost day and night from helping Klai Yisrael, from trying to do chesed. And, and we're not on that level, but we're at least on a level to try to help the people around us. Your wife needs help, anyone needs help. And on a, on a simple level, keep your eyes open for anything in the street, anything, any person who seems to need a chesed. This person seems to be depressed, right? Just ask him how he's doing. Just that itself could be a tremendous chesed that could keep the world going, could bring tremendous chef into the world. There's another thing in this Parsha which I wanted to talk about, which is Loit. Loit 
the son of Abram. We don't have enough time really to talk about the whole everything about him. Hmm? Because he took him under his wing after Haran, uh, Lot's father, died. And right, that's a whole lesson. Why did Haran die? And Abram was saved from the Kibshana Aish because they went into the with different with different uh, types of Amuna. And that went down to Lot. Lot didn't have the proper level of Amuna. On some level, he was weak in his Amuna, which eventually, when he went to Sodom, Rashi says he left his belief in Hashem behind. And when the Malachim came and saved him, the Rashi says he ended up coming back to a belief in Hashem. Because he said, Rashi says here, when he used the shame Hashem, he really meant Hashem. Whereas earlier in the partial, he says the name of Hashem, he means like my masters. So he did change. He changed and he became a believer again. But what was his schus to be saved? As we were saying, we want to find a schus to be saved. We want to, we want to have some way of being saved from catastrophe, saved from danger. We see Lot. The Malachim came and just sort of plucked him out of this horrible, horrible catastrophe, right? Mom is just like a little rose. You're plucking out, and then the whole rest of it gets burnt down. Why? So he was actually thought it might be his own schus, right? And he wasn't sure how much he had. He's right, he didn't have that much. The Rashi, the Gemara says, the, I'm sorry, the Torah says that it was really Hashem remembered Avram and he saved Lot. There's a plus in this week's partial. Hashem remembered Avram and he saved Lot. Rashi says, where, where, how, did, where, how does Avram fit into this? It actually ended up causing Avram Saras because he had to move his house to another place where there would be more Orchim later when Sodom was destroyed. But how did Lot's being saved? So Rashi says, because Lot had done a chesed to Avram, not even a big one. When they went down to Mitzrayim and Avram decided he has to present Sarah as his sister, even though that would create problems, but that was the only way he felt he could be saved from worse difficulties. So he presented his, right? And actually, if you look in the Psukim at the end of Noah, when it describes Avram and Lot and Haran and Sarah, it says that Haran was Sarah's father as well. So really, Lot and Sarah were sister, were brother and sister, ironically. If I'm correct, it looks to me in the Psukim as if that's the way to read the Psukim. And yet, Abram says, she's my sister. So really, what should Lot have not naturally said? No, she's not your sister. She's my sister. Right? She's your wife. right? But he didn't. He kept quiet. So he didn't even do anything positively. He just kept his mouth shut. Just for keeping his mouth shut, Right? Which we learn in this week's Gomorrah that how important it is the language we use, etc., etc. And sometimes just not saying a bad word, not saying something which would cause difficulty, would is the best piece of advice. Gomorrah says that Tola Eretz al Blima, Hashem hangs the entire world. Tola Eretz al Blima, Hashem hangs as if it's like a thing hanging here called the world, and it's like hanging by a little string here. It's all hanging by what? Al Bulima. Bulima means bowl and peeve, Bishas Mariba. Someone who keeps his mouth shut at a time of argument. Someone's arguing with you and you keep your mouth shut to try to make peace. Obviously, if you're making him more angry, you just say, okay, then you should say, okay. But it's very often if we start to speak when our wife is yelling at us or whatever, we know it's just gonna get out of hand, right? I'm gonna say, well, you're another. And then she's gonna say, what? Say that about you, yeah, it just gets worse and worse, right? Bolam piv shas mariva. Someone just keeps his mouth shut. Tola eretz al blima. Hashem makes the whole world hang on that person. That person just kept the entire world alive by keeping his mouth shut. That's what that's what Lot did. Lot kept his mouth shut, and and out of a karasato for that, and Abram did have a karasato. Hashem said, therefore, I do not want to kill Lot. Lot has a schus to stay alive because of what he did for Abram. And it could be shot because it will make Abram very sad to hear his, his nephew. As we see later, he went, or last week's part, he chased after and created a whole war, World War III, right, to save Lot, his nephew. And it would have bothered Abram to have heard Lot die because of that, that chesed that he did, he deserved to be saved. So just a little chesed could sometimes bring so much bracha to the world. Like Abram, like in the Teva, and even just a small thing, just to be careful not to say a bad word at the wrong time, not to rat someone out, not to, to someone, someone uh, we had a person who was selling eggs in Telstone, 
right? Uh, according to the, uh, he should have reported to the whatever and had it. But he was a, a simple fellow, who was just trying to keep his family alive, right? Someone used to run a, a, a pharmacy in their house. Same thing. Someone ratted them out. Someone just ratted them out, right? All of a sudden, they're not doing it anymore. Why? Well, they got into trouble. Right? Who? We're a closed community. How did these people find out? Someone ratted them out. Right? That's the one from Lod. Even Lod knew not, not to do that. And that was a schus for Lod. Therefore, we have to be very careful what we say, what we don't say. We have to try. The guiding principle has to be to do chesed. To try is hard to do chesed, which could be learning Torah and helping others learn Torah and also doing mitzvahs. And all this is a chesed for the world in a general sense, but physically to help people. That brings tremendous brach into the world, and we need that kind of protection today. We need the Teva of Noyach. We need to be, have the schus of coming out of this closed little existence, as it were, like the coming out of the Teva to create a new world. We need that same schus today. And that's why Avram said, I want to create that kind of a nation. I want to start with my own household. And therefore, he taught us how to do that. And that's what we see in this week's parsha. We see from Lloyd, another schus to be saved. Hashem should give us the strength and the wisdom and the perseverance to continue to create such such greatness that the, that the Brum created that even we see that his nephew carried on and, and it was a tremendous boost and therefore we have to try as hard as we can to, to for the sake of our own selves our families our communities and this uh, Hashem should help all of Klai Yisrael bring Shia. מכל החסדים ומכל האמת אשר עשית את עבדך קטונתי מכל החסדים ומכל האמת אשר עשית את עבדך